Okay. Good afternoon, Frank Miller. I'm the uh, CTO for Sienna and EMEA. I'm here to talk about the journey to the adaptive network. So I appreciate the time today. I know it's getting a little late in the afternoon. Um, you know, I don't know about you guys. Um, need more coffee, but uh, I, I'm glad to be here. So here's something ironic for you. So a little bit about where I came from. I'm, I'm normally on the service provider side of the house unless there's a piece of technology missing, and then I go to the vendor side to build it. So I was a CTO in US cable for seven years, and I was very frustrated with the economics, cost economics, especially on access. So I went off to build a virtualized CMTS, do a bunch of stuff that also turned into Doxis 3.1. Right. Uh, another big irony is I was actually the global chief architect for CenturyLink. So during these four years, <laughs> see you, man. Yeah. So so during these four years, um, my main mission was literally the digital transformation of, of CenturyLink, and I was luckily empowered with some amazing teams, including the cloud team, the public cloud team, and we built a public cloud reference that competed well with Amazon. Um, the network transformation team that includes edge compute, merchant silicon, uh, SDN, and even uh, you know kind of throw VNFs and NFE frameworks in there. And what I did is that, that took about four years to get it started to kick the engine off, um, you know, move edge compute down to the central office, start to push out, you know, build an SD WAN product, um, build a new next generation OSS platform. All these things were accomplished. And then I decided, um, since I lived in Monroe, Louisiana, which I don't know if you've been to Louisiana, it's, you know, it's Louisiana. It's out, you know, it's got alligators and bayous, and you know, it's not where you're gonna raise family. I decided to take a job in London and work for Sienna. Uh, Sienna was my key partner in this journey, so what the heck, let's give it another shot. By the way, that was an absolutely horrible picture. I can't, but you know, that's the way it goes. Never grow a goatee. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about this. I'm not here to talk about, you know, Sienna. You know, I'm really here to talk about, I don't even like the word digital transformation. I'm just trying to cover what's going on in telecom and cable with service providers and trying to stay comp competitive and build um, frameworks of the future. So some things are driving us. You know, one, ah, here we go. Market trends, right? Content is still king. There's 5G, IoT, machine to machine. There's pressure for softwareization. So first, there's market trends, there's technology trends, more and more bandwidth. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I built access networks right as Netflix started. And all of a sudden, my entire business model was totally destroyed because bandwidth uh, at peak, 95% peak, um, was growing uh, over 100% a year, which is why we started pushing other abstraction models, uh, other technology trends, disaggregation, virtualization, analytics. Finally, we see platforms that are enabling the future, and I'll talk about this more, right? So the evolution has started, right? This is something that, you know, luckily I was at CenturyLink and the journey started, you know, gosh, about five years ago now. I think we're all going through this journey globally. Back in the old easy days, it was just application services with the quad play. Life seemed pretty easy. You ran services. Um, over the following platforms, right? For me, I had a CMTS, a BNG, I had eNodeBs. And it was a static, physical, multi-layer uh, infrastructure-based network. Wasn't perfect to manage and orchestrate, but we kind of found a way to do it, right? But you know, these times are changing, right? Everybody, there's a digital experience, number one. Number two, um, there has to be a way to bring this digital experience and literally make it more, how do you say, more cloud-like, right? The ability to, to deliver quicker uh, time to market, the ability to try to leverage what's going on with data centers, right? You know, really wonderful merchant silicon references that come out in the packet design, packet domain, some way to move up the value chain to software, right? You know, how do we make this happen? So once again, we've moved from what it used to be to a digital life experience, networks as a service, What's fascinating also is we've kind of, we've moved to um, a new world where the orchestration 
and the automation, the analytics, the slicing, all these buzzwords we have. But the bottom line is we have a much more richer, richer toolkit to make this happen. Um, finally, um, you've seen the virtualization of cloud go to the network. I don't know about you guys, but I actually went through a phase of my life where I got rid of my giant mainframes and actually blew them out when it was applicable as a distributed VM. Um, actually, the main driver for me to do that was Oracle buying Sun, right? I knew what Oracle was going to do. So I went out and moved everything to Linux and you know, blew them out on a distributed framework. Um, pushing that virtualization abstraction made me start to think in the late 2000s that, wow, we can do this in network. Had some friends at Stanford. Um, they actually were working on what became SDN. I knew it was going to be a good world. So the second thing from orchestration is virtualization. Uh, distribution of compute resources. This is interesting too. So for me, um, at CenturyLink, I knew that I had to have some way to build a distributed edge compute and orchestratable framework. Where would I find the money? For me, I found the money in deprecated class five switches. Didn't want to replace them. So I took that capital and instead built an edge compute. I think AT&T calls it Cord. Um, we had a different reference. And finally, you have programmable hardware. So in this case, you know, a packet optical underlay, you have Yang exposure to devices, you know, thank you, Juniper, for starting to work with APIs instead of CLIs, right? So you start to combine all these things and you have a platform to build a digital lifestyle with a, and which pushes an architecture evolution. So let's talk about some of the new tools that, that go to this. If you look at the problem, how are some of the ways you get here? Number one is, we already talked about it, cloud everywhere. Second one, if you're gonna go cloudy, then, you know, be totally frank about this. Um, gosh, that's a pun, that's my first name. Um, to be frank about this, I had to move an entire telecom org from a traditional legacy OSS stack framework and an 18 month runway to product development to developing like cloud people, right? And if you're gonna be like cloud people, it has to be API driven, it has to be software driven, the complexity of the hardware has to leave. The platform has to be bloody rich enough that your people doing development are developing products and not lost in the weeds, right? So that's where you have um, orchestration and automation with a rich platform. Third one is, it's not only, sorry, I misspelled that, VNFs, but there has to be a disaggregated distributed service platform that you can deliver this virtualization abstraction on. So for instance, at Centrelink, what the fellow was at before, we actually had the ability to spin up bare metal, spin up VMs, spin up KVMs, spin up edge mano domains, spin up you know, uh, uh, container frameworks, whatever we need, we could actually spin up and orchestrate anywhere. The final thing to tie this together is you need some way of having remote control, not just down to layer one. If you can, see if you can get down to layer, sorry, I'm gonna call it layer zero, right? So I'm not trying to do a business pitch, but at Sienna, for instance, we have full exposure from a service model perspective all the way down to the photonic level, right? I mean, if you're gonna build this, build this right and make it so you don't have to roll trucks anymore. So let's put this all together now. If we put this all together in between software control and automation, if we put this together with programmable infrastructure, right? And finally, if we add analytics and intelligence, you have a closed loop, right? You really have an adaptive network. And I know this sounds like you know, marketing hooey, but at the end of the day, this is real, you know, this is doable, and we really stand at a unique point um, in the evolution of today's network if we do this properly, right? There are many missing gaps here. There are many missing components in the standard bodies to make this happen. That's where you know, each one of us on the SP side and the vendor side need to find our own journey. So here's an example of what's missing. Um, if you're going to have a distributed edge compute framework that you orchestrate end to end with all the telemetry, you know, put down to let's say a big data framework, you know, edge, an edge Hadoop framework all the way to a northbound data lake, you're not going to send all the data northbound, number one. Number two, in the edge, you're not gonna send all your orchestration decisions northbound, right? You're gonna distribute this. So here's one thing that's actually missing. What's missing is the ability to actually have domains of authority and more like metadata models as you head northbound into your data lake, 
right? Because there's going to be some decisions that you can make at the edge where you might have events transpiring or your predictive framework says there's going to be a problem. You have full visibility of the inventory and the topology framework. You see there's going to be a problem. Great. Move a workload, right? Great. Uh, spin up a new Lambda and do your layer three to layer uh, one and zero traffic engineering and then make the notation northbound. And all the standard bodies, I don't see any true discussion on this, on how to do proper telemetry and data management in your next generation operational framework. So that's one domain that's missing. There's a, a couple of the domains that are missing too if you look at what's going on in the various standard bodies today, right? So, but it doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means that it takes some thinking and diligence and engagement. Okay, so what are the desired outcomes? We talked about the adaptive network. We talked about the cloudification of the network, about the cloudification of service functions in order to try to get it so we can deliver services like cloud folks as service providers. Well, desired outcomes is you want a, a vibrant ecosystem with interoperability and openness. Here's a big one is service velocity, programmability, um, analytics, automation. Third one is efficiency, okay? We already talked about the business model. I want to get cloud economics in the network that I got in my um, virtualization of servers. And finally, control. This is an interesting one too, okay? So uh, I, don't hold me accountable for this one, but this is fascinating. So I, I like to code. Right, so I'm a nutty guy. I usually code every other night. I'm actually working now through, um, I, the, the last neural network code I did was in the early 90s. I'm trying to do it now with current tool chains. When I was, usually the first thing I do when I go into a tier one is I go and try to find where are all the coding people. And the last tier one I was at, I couldn't find the coding people. I found the, I found the slideware people. I found the spreadsheet people. I couldn't find the coding people. You know, I went down five layers. That really doesn't work for me, right? So, for instance, I, I, had, I had the public cloud unit, I had the network unit, um, right? The cloud unit, the, the, there was three layers when I got to the coders, and actually at least the middle layer at night actually coded with the folks. So, for me, control is a big thing. If you have a rich enough platform can you take control of um, your future again, right? I mean, can, can you actually just focus on spending your capital on creating products that generate revenue, for instance, right? It's better for your customers. So those are desired outcomes, I think, if you want to compete. Um, getting there, of course, requires transformation. We talked about software-based transformation. Um, we talked about service and function virtualization right underneath the software, and finally transport um, layer evolution. These are the three layers that you look at if you start to look at separating your uh, control and data plane. I think we all know this. Whoops, going the wrong way. <laughs> so let's talk about components for enabling this. So for programmable infrastructure, once again, it really ties to putting more features and you know, control, it's just common sense but it's tutable capacity and also constant programmable um, innovation, right? So a good point, I'm not trying to be a sales guy here, is once again, from a Sienna perspective, you don't have to roll trucks, right? As you build your, your photonic domains, OTN, Rotom, you know, whatever, you have availability from a programming standpoint, not only to build and construct, but also to maintain. So for instance, you have visibility into your optical SNR levels, you know, in addition to your standard network errors. Um, intelligent automation, common platform. Um, I know now we have microservice-based architectures. There could be different architectures later. And a DevOps integration approach. This, the, I, I think microservice-based architectures, we can give that all back to Netflix and Adrian Cockroft. We're still doing this. I do think DevOps integration is important because you're not developing something and throwing it over the berm to ops and saying good luck. You're developing this from the beginning with ops. Common platform is really interesting. So at CenturyLink, there actually is a common platform when I left. The platform that's used for the public cloud folks are actually the platform that's used for the network for leaning uh, product engineering folks, right? So that's, you know, once again, the richness of a platform. The, I, I didn't give an architecture slide, 
but what's actually um, had to be done in the middle is if you look at a cloud structure, the orchestration, chef, puppet, ansible, name it, it's usually good enough because you live in a universe that you have full logical inventory, you know what you have through the BIOS, you know, through talking to the switch. If you're trying to engineer a complex um, network in a telecom, it's much more complicated, right? From a layer zero to layer three inventory and topology, um, path compute frameworks at all the layers, a global path compute, it is phenomenally complicated. I had to bring the cloud guys in who said they could do anything and start to explain with the network guys how bloody complicated it is to build an enterprise network, right? So at least for CenturyLink, leverage of Blue Planet, which comes with these um, discovery, um, combination of legacy and um, discoverable inventory, creation of topology across all the layers tied to the service domain became the orchestration engine for traditional cloud services, but also network services. So at least the way you built these services was similar. Um, openness, once again, we all like open APIs. Um, at least at Sienna, we're real believers in this, in exposure. We're really deeply involved with TMform when it comes to their open-based APIs that are tied to management and administration and integration with um, other OSS systems. Examples are Whitebox Rotom. That's also big at Sienna as we separate our optical resources into a disaggregation frameworks. Um, but once again, it just provides choice. Services and expertise is interesting because I already talked about the gaps, right? Not all the componentry I think is out there from a standards perspective. You know, if you look beyond Etsy to actually build a total end-to-end -end distributed edge compute orchestratable framework, right? There, there are gaps there. Um, I think leveraging your peers, you know, finding partner with your peers, you know, find a good um, vendor partner, right? It can be done. The only other advice I, I can provide in this is, um, whew, don't eat the whole enchilada, right? A uh, horrible metaphor, but you know, back in the old days when you stood up an, an OSS stack, you know, that was like Sherman's march to the ocean, took three years, dropped $60 million for even brought back a nickel. Don't, don't do that anymore. If you build these kind of service platforms, find the right products that fit on this, that bring in revenue right away, and get, you know, start to build success, start to build a center of excellence, right? So the product that was demonstrated that we built at CenturyLink with the fellow who was here before was SD-WAN. We built an SD-WAN product that was hybrid, right? That was in 2015. It started out with a vCPE, right, to VNFs that were set up northbound. It actually included DCI, you know, data center interconnectivity across multiple domains. You know, we did that at CenturyLink in 2015, right? Took three quarters. But once we did it, you know, the board believed in us, and then we were able to find other products to put on this, right? So my thing here, once again, is don't, don't develop a huge monster stack. My recommendation is find a key pain point and demonstrate your uh, success piece by piece, right? Um, so, gosh, I actually gave you guys back about a minute and 30 seconds. Got all excited. So, um, last minute, anybody have any questions? Or I just stumped you with words? <laughs> okay, so um, my uh, email address sh uh, should be published on the slides. I'm glad to share. I specifically came here today not to do a vendor pitch but to really share what transformation tastes like for a service provider. So, uh, you know, feel free to look me up. Okay, thanks guys. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.